He was an educated man who spent some time studying at theological college that stood in my office. Currently in mainstream employment, he lamented about how the church he believed had lost its way, suggesting that Jesus was more concerned about societal or social issues than about spiritual ones. The implication was that this man looked with favour at the things that we were doing through um, activities such as care works, but not so much on the churchy stuff. It was a timely reminder to me of how easy it is for individuals and congregations and churches to become disorientated in life's journey. There is a tension that pulls for Christians, for churches, for communities, for denominations as a whole, for missional movements in different directions. Should we focus more on social transformation or on spiritual transformation? And when it comes to our priorities like this and in many other areas of life, we as churches and even for us as Christians in what we give, what we focus on, we wonder what is more important. What is important for one person can be different to another and it's caused divisions and splits and hurt and pain. But it's also provided opportunities for the seeds of renewal and revitalization as people wrestle with the sense of what God is calling them to do and the priorities of God in their life. Over the next dozen weeks or so, we're going to be exploring common ground, ground on which the churches of Christ journey. What's central, what's the guiding principles and values that draw us together and to give us focus? And while at times we will draw from our history as a missional movement, each week we'll take time to consider what it means for us individually and for Northern Community Church of Christ, what it means for us as a faith community in our future mission and ministry. So rather than tearing us apart through selfish ambition and personal protests, Understanding our history, our story, our identity and the common ground on which we stand helps us to better journey together with a common passion, a common purpose that reunites us with Creator Christ. My hope and prayer are that conversations will be stimulated and that there will be a deepening commitment to the call that Jesus places on our life and on this his church. So let me take a moment to pray. Jesus, we invite you to speak to us afresh. Holy Spirit, we we ask that you would move amongst us and within us, that you would go into those places that we would prefer to keep dark and hidden, that you would shine your light, your good light on us, And help us to be all that you long and empower us to be. Amen. It was in the late 1700s and early 1800s that a movement arose in America and in Britain as well. And out of it came a desire to renew an understanding of what it meant to be New Testament Christians in the new world of America and elsewhere. Like layers of wax or stain on furniture, years of application and tradition of doctrine and rules and rituals had obscured the beauty and the simplicity of the timber grain of the gospel message. For people such as Thomas and Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, in the 1800s, theirs was a desire to strip away these layers and to renew a vision of what Christianity and church could and should be. Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone were both passionate evangelists and wanted to share with those around them the simple message of God's saving love that is expressed and experienced in the person of Jesus Christ. Campbell and Stone helped plant the seeds of what became known as the churches of Christ. And over the last 200 years, what has emerged Uh, different slogans that help to sum up who we are and we'll touch on those from time to time as well. One of those slogans that is captured by 
that captures Campbell and Stone's message is that of no creed but Christ. Since the formation of the New Testament church, there has come a series of creeds and statements of faith that become gates, almost as it were, passcodes or passwords or secret codes to unlock doors to the entry of the church. As a church family, we journey on common ground with other churches of Christ who seek to push through these layers of code and dogma that can obscure and prevent people from encountering Jesus of the New Testament. We echo the call of Campbell that nothing should be made a test of fellowship that God has not made a test for going to heaven. As a church and as a part of being on this common ground of being a part of the churches of Christ, we keep Jesus of the Bible front and centre. And it's within the pages of the sacred text we discover the occasions when Jesus' first followers were asked of their impressions of Jesus and their understanding of his identity. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19, we read this, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the kingdoms, kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. As a missional movement, we journey on common ground in our conviction of the central and core, what is core to our identity is that our belief, our rock, is not the apostle, but the statement of faith that Jesus is, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Christ. Christ is the Greek equivalent of the word Messiah. And so you'll sometimes hear us refer to Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Christ or Jesus Christ. The Old Testament speaks of God's people who grew to look forward to the coming of the Saviour, the Messiah. And the New Testament Testament gives an account and evidence of uh, the support of the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, God's Son, sent to save us from our sins and the consequences of our sins. But the central figure in Scripture is Jesus the Christ. He is also kept front and centre of the common ground on which churches of Christ stand. We do not pray to the apostles, although their lives and writings can help us to understand what it looks like to follow Jesus. We don't follow or pray to people identified by some churches as saints, although they can have a powerful example and challenge us and encourage us on what it means to follow Jesus. We don't follow or pray to angels. After all, their role was to proclaim Jesus' birth and are sent by God to aid us, to defend us, to help us in our following of Jesus. We don't even follow pastors or podcasts or Facebook friends, although they can help us to understand a little bit more of what it means to follow Jesus. The central figure we follow and what draws us to this common ground is our simple yet profound profession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, is the Son of the living God. In 1957, E.L. Williams, the principal of what would become known as Stirling College, wrote, The Lordship of Christ is a doctrine we delight to emphasise both in word and deed. We simply cannot with consistency confess him as Lord and still say no to him. To confess him as Lord is 
to obey him. The centrality of Jesus the Christ not only transforms our relationship with eternity, it also it transforms us now. Jesus transforms us now, individually and also as a faith community. The name of our missional movement is an ever-present reminder of that unifying call. We are the churches of Christ. This Northern Community Church of Christ or Thornbury Church of Christ or One Church in Blackburn or White Hill in Queensland or Spires in Western Australia. For every Churches of Christ church around the world, we declare in our name, in our identity, who we belong to. This is Jesus' church. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to the leadership group. It doesn't belong to the Churches of Christ in Vic Taz. It doesn't belong to Prop Corp. This is Jesus' church. It affects how we make decisions, what our priorities are, what our non-negotiables are, our focus, our direction. If we followed Buddha or Krishna or any other identity, it would be appropriate to have their name in our identity. That's why we are known as the Churches of Christ. Because we are passionate about keeping Jesus front and centre. And it is on this common ground that we not only stand with other Churches of Christ, but we also accept other as others as brothers and sisters, all people who accept Jesus as the Christ. As Sterling, one of the past principals of the Bible College, understood it. This does not mean a compromising silence about Christological matters, matters in our understanding of who is Christ, but rather continuing discussion in love and with respect for each other's genuine convictions. Nor does it mean compromising our witness and our mission as churches of Christ in other matters of belief any more than we would expect other followers of Christ to compromise theirs. Yet we stand on common ground with every other person who believes and accepts that Jesus is both Lord and Saviour. But it's not just any Jesus that we claim to be the Christ. Nor is it any rendition or interpretation of Jesus that we follow. It is not the Jesus of Google or the Jesus of Philip Yancey or the Jesus of Sterling, or Williams, or Menzies, or whoever it might be, insights from others can be helpful. But ultimately, we follow Jesus of the Bible. An integral part of who we are as churches of Christ, and the common ground on which we journey as a missional movement, is the final authority of God as revealed through the Scriptures. Jesus Christ is at the heart of the Bible. As Peter said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus of the Bible is the ultimate authority and the ultimate revelation of God. Once again, Sterling wrote, Christ as the ultimate authority for the church. This means that Christians submit themselves totally to his authority, accepting and living his lifestyle, letting him empower them so to live and taking seriously in their lives and churches what is revealed about him in the New Testament. That is why we hold the Bible and especially the New Testament so central to our faith. That is why the reading of the Bible as a church and personally is so important to us. It helps us to stay focused helps us to stay centred on Jesus and keeps us united on this common ground. As we follow Jesus of the Bible, it is the Word becoming flesh again in and through us. We don't place our faith in creeds or in repeating phrases. The essence of Christianity is faith in a person. It's not something that a parent can do for us. It is a personal response to the person of Jesus the Christ. We don't test a person's ability of whether they're a Christian or not on their ability to recite some creed or doctrine. The only true test of fellowship is when a person confesses Jesus as their Lord 
and Saviour. I wonder, do you know Jesus personally? Is he central to your life? Does he influence and affect your decisions, your actions, your words, more and more as you get to know him better and better? Some years ago, in Calvary Baptist Church, California, Pastor Shadrach Lockridge preached his one hour and six minute message, which I thought might be nice for us to hear a part of today. Not the whole one hour and six minutes, just a few minutes. And it is central to our understanding of our journey as a missional movement. We'll listen to the, la- the latter three minutes of his message now. Thanks. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Not bad, eh? I, I can just picture the congregation with their hankies waving them around in a, a good African-American way. and Yeah. But the response is that. And the question is that. Do you know him as your king? As we respond today, there are three reflections that I'd like us to consider. The first is to echo that of Lockridge. Do you know Jesus the Christ? Do you know him as your king? If not, make a commitment today to get to know him. 
The second is, would you like to get to know Jesus better? I'd love to chat to you more about that. Or you can have a chat to Matt or Alethea um, or someone else that you know that is a follower of Jesus. You can chat to them and say, hey, listen, I'd love to get to know Jesus better. Tell me, what do you do to get to know Jesus better? Help me understand that. The third question is, is Jesus the central person in your life? Are you living your life in ever-increasing obedience in following Jesus? When it comes to our priorities as churches, our giving as Christians, what we give our time, our life to, what is more important? It's not about pursuing greater avenues or evidence of social justice or having increased um, concern for social issues. It's not about Bible bashing people either. The most important thing, the common ground on which we stand, what we journey on as a missional movement, is that wherever Jesus of the Bible goes, we will go. Wherever he leads, we will follow. Whatever he calls us to do, we will do. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's take some time to respond to God now.